software to kind of make your life easier and do things faster. Um, so with that, um, we're going to be building uh, what I call a Tweefle eventually, which is called a Twitter raffle. Um, and the way it's going to work is uh, during this webinar, uh, if you tweet with Flatiron Zapier with this hashtag, you'll have a chance to win a $25 Amazon gift card, assuming that uh, I don't get super nervous and uh, can actually build the program I want to build that is kind of uh, what Zapier would allow you to do without knowing how, how to code the way I do right now. Um, so yeah, with that, we're going to kind of get started. And uh, you know, as I said, like follow Zapier, follow Flatiron School on Twitter. Feel free to tweet your favorite quotes. Um, if you use the hashtag Flatiron Zapier, um, you will be able to win a gift card at the end, assuming that I can build it. Um, I should be able to. Um, so with that, I'm Avi. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Flatiron School, as I said. Uh, I've been programming for like, I don't know, 15 years or something. Uh, I started teaching around five years ago. Um, and uh, before that, I ran another company called Designer Pages. And before that, I worked at a hedge fund that recruited me when I was still in college, when I was 19. Um, I've written software patents. I've taught Carly Kloss and Rebecca Minkoff how to program. I love speaking at events. I like to fly on the weekends. And sometimes I program with two computers. So the Flatiron School, if you don't know, we teach people how to become professional software developers. Uh, we do something called full stack web development, uh, which is basically all the languages you need to know in order to build web applications like Facebook or Airbnb or Zapier or Twitter. Um, so that's HTML and Ruby and SQL and the Ruby on Rails web framework and JavaScript and jQuery and React and Ember and Angular and a whole bunch of fun stuff. We also teach mobile development and some basic front end development in person in New York City in our campus. Uh, it's a 12-week program. We also do it online, um, so you can actually attend the school remotely um, if that's more convenient. And that's a little bit about us. And with that, I'm going to let Jordan introduce himself. Hey, y'all. I'm Jordan Shear. I'm a software developer and entrepreneur from Atlanta, Georgia, where it's hot and humid today. Um, I lead the product engineering team at Zapier. And uh, I've been here for about since last October. Uh, I've been programming for about 11 years now. Uh, and I started as a junior web developer in a small agency in Chicago and worked my way up uh, and adding on different programming languages and technologies and uh, uh, experience throughout uh, the various uh, uh, businesses and stuff that I, I worked at. So now I'm at uh, Zapier and uh, running product engineering team and we're doing some really cool stuff. Um, so if we can switch to the next slide, uh, we've got the agenda for today. And we're going to go a little bit of, about what Zapier does and, and uh, automation is awesome. So Zapier is basically uh, a way to do a whole bunch of cool automation stuff, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to go into how you can use code inside of Zapier uh, to even make it more awesome, do some things that uh, aren't configured out of the box, uh, allowing you to interact uh, and basically change the way Zapier works for you. Uh, I'm just going to go over some programming concepts of what's happening inside of a Zap and then do a little interactive coding, building a bot from scratch. So uh, that's going to be pretty cool. And after that, we'll do some question and answers. So to get started. <clears throat> um, Jordan, I'm going to make you a presenter so that you can share a screen. Oh. Is that OK? Uh, sh sure, yeah. Cool. Um, does that work? That you should be able to share a screen now. Sure, yeah, yeah. All right, let me see here. Uh, well, where did my, uh, well, now, where did my, uh... Cool, I can see your screen now, Jordan, so you should be okay. Okay, perfect, there we go. Um, well, I wanted to go through, uh, basically, uh, what is Zapier? So Zapier, it's a workflow automation tool. Uh, basically, it takes care of some tedious stuff that you would handle every day manually. Basically, uh, interacting with data from one web service to another, transitioning and tra uh, translating it into various formats and allowing you to just do some really cool stuff. Uh, the neat thing is that there's out of the box, there's no coding required. You can go in and connect Gmail to Dropbox to Twitter uh, without having to write a single line of code. And we have over 500 different apps uh, that are built into Zapier that you can interact with, uh, basically pulling data from and actually writing new data out. The neat thing is we also have a free account, uh, which gives you access to uh, all of this, uh, so you can play around uh, and decide if it works for you. Um, so let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper. What is automation? So automation basically is uh, allowing you to take uh, an action uh, that happens in one service 
uh, somewhere else. Uh, and you can create basically these little workflows of uh, taking that data and, and moving it through different services and uh, changing the way it's uh, represented to you uh, and your uh, basically services. So some examples here. So every time you uh, get a Gmail message that's starred, send it to your to-do list. Or post a new Trello activity in Slack. Or every time you get a uh, new GitHub commit, share that commit on Twitter. Um, and uh, so you can really build these really neat uh, workflows that kind of automate this task in the background. So basically, all the aspects where you would have to go in and say, every time you get a Gmail message, I have to go to my to-do list and manually type that message into my to-do list to handle it. Well, you can do that automatically uh, by setting up a Zap. And it runs in the background on our servers, uh, and just it, it's basically magic. Uh, the neat thing is that you can also do uh, get in and actually create new ways to interact with uh, data using code. We uh, offer a, a code step inside of Zaps, which allow you to write code in JavaScript or Python to take the data from any of those services and manipulate it in any way that you want, and then do things that Zapier uh, isn't built to do today. Um, so some of those things, basic, doing basic math, using other APIs that we don't integrate with, uh, making all of the text of your Twitter messages uppercase or leet speak or uh, translating it into a different, uh, a different language, uh, all of those things are available to you uh, at, at your will uh, by writing us a little bit of code. And so with that, we're going to do a little demo. I have pre-built a couple of Zaps and Zapier to show you. Uh, basically, the power that uh, Zapier provides um, out of the box. <laughs> and then also we have a little bit of code. So uh, the first one I wanted to show you uh, is this, this little wake up. Those that when you're at a hotel, you can call the front desk and ask you to wake you up at a specific time. Well, with Zapier, we have a schedule API and connection with uh, Twilio, which, which you can basically create a Zap to do that for you. And so this is Are You Awake? So let's dive in. So our first step of Are You Awake, it's called a trigger. Triggers basically are actions that happen outside of Zapier that you want uh, to cause this Zap to run. Uh, so with this, we have a schedule by Zapier. Uh, it's an app that we've built. And we can set it to trigger every day or a specific day uh, if we went into a different, uh, uh, a different trigger. Uh, or you can do every month or every week. And after that, I'm going to say, every day at 9 AM, not on the weekends, we're going to run this trigger. And uh, the next step after that, so every time uh, this trigger will happen, it will flow through the rest of the steps of this app. And so every day at 9 AM, we're going to run through the next action, which is call my phone. So at 9 AM, we're going to call my phone, and it's going to give me this message, are you awake yet? And we're going to go through it. And I'm actually going to demo this right now. So we're going to have this call my phone. Let's see if we can cue this. Oh, there we go. Can you hear this? Yeah. Are you awake yet? Ha, that's so cool. So if you could hear that, it, it asked me if I was awake yet. So then the next step, I'm going to have a little bit of a delay. It, it takes me about a minute to wake up after that phone call. So we're going to delay for one minute. And then I'm going to have it send me a text message to make sure I'm awake. Better be up, Al. Let's see how that works. Yep, there it is. So uh, with this just simple little uh, uh, connecting the dots, basically, of these different uh, triggers and actions, you can create some really it's a great API. Uh, you can start using that for free um, as well. So the next one I wanted to demo is going to go a little bit deeper. Uh, and we're going to connect basically Slack, which is a chat room, uh, and basically parse out some messages that, uh, uh, that you could uh, put inside of the channel. So every once in a while, I want to know if it's going to rain in my city or in some other city. And so I have a chat room here set up inside of Slack. And every time that I've connected my Slack account, and every time that I want a, a new message that's posted to the general channel, I want it to trigger this zap. And after that, 
I only want to continue if the text in that in the uh, message that was posted to that chat room contains the word rain. Because what I want to know is I want to be able to type into Slack saying, will it rain in Atlanta? And it will tell me whether that. So now we're going to get into some uh, of the code where uh, you can go in and basically change the way that Zapier works. So we have a little bit of uh, uh, metadata here for uh, passing in the text from uh, the, uh, the Slack message, uh, the chat room, and then we can operate on that text here in this code. And so I have this pre-written. I won't, I won't bore you with the writing uh, of the code right now. We'll let Avi do that later uh, when he's building his Twitter bot. But what this is going to do, and I'll walk through it real quick, what this is going to do is this is going to uh, basically parse out which city I'm talking about inside of my message using a regular expression. It's really looking for the, uh, the pattern, um, looking for the pattern, uh, will it rain in Atlanta? So in Atlanta is what I'm looking for here. And I'm going to use the open weather map API to check the weather for Atlanta. And so uh, if you haven't seen that, openweathermap.org it's uh, for tiers that you can sign up with, but uh, they have an open API with an API key that you can sign up, uh, that you get when you sign up. I'm getting current weather, historical data, um, all this really neat stuff. So an example of that, and here's just what you would get back if you're querying for like Las Vegas, Nevada, of when it's going to rain. Uh, you get all this data. Uh, this is all these various, uh, 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 what the temperature's going to be, what the weather's going to be like, um, but down here, there's a nice little uh, spot to tell you whether or not it's going to rain. And so we're going to look for that inside of here. So we're going to call that API basically with where we want the, uh, the query to be from. Uh, and then we're going to basically check to see if it says it's going to rain. And if it is, when that's going to happen. Uh, and so during that, uh, we then output, will it rain or not, the message. And I'm going to post that message back to the Slack channel. So the last step, I'm going to put it, send a message back to the Slack channel with whether or not it's going to be. Uh, so let's turn this on. Oh, I guess we have to test this real quick. Step three is. There we go. Okay. And we're going to turn this on, and then we're going to go to the Slack channel and ask. Will it rain in Atlanta? All right, looks like uh, on Friday at 12, it's going to rain in Atlanta. That's pretty cool. So that that right there is just kind of showing you a little bit of the power of Zapier. This right here, uh, we don't have a connection to Open, open Weather Map, but we were able to make one with just a little bit of code uh, and be able to look at data. And so now I'm going to hand this back over to Avi. Cool. Thanks so much, Jordan. Jordan, what languages can you uh, add to, uh, to uh to Zaps. to Zaps. So you're writing in Python there, but I've seen also JavaScript. What other languages do you support? Yeah, so we support JavaScript and uh, and Python for code steps. Um, and that right there uh, is basically uh, what I was writing in was in Python. Um, so I could switch that when I was setting up the code step uh, into JavaScript uh, and then be able to use normal JavaScript patterns uh, for my code. Um, when our yeah, with our developer platform, uh, that's basically 100% uh, JavaScript, kind of centered around that. Cool. Awesome. Um, that was a really cool demo. So uh, I guess the next part of the presentation, because um, Zapier is great, and uh, I think that the ability to kind of do that stuff when you're uh, as, as uh, being able to kind of do that uh, you know, adding that bits are really cool, and I guess um, because Zapier is also just built in code, the pretty fun part is kind of thinking about what abstractly or generically is happening behind the scenes in Zapier, and kind of uh, starting to think about programming that. Um, because programming is awesome. Um, it's like so much fun to do, and it's kind of like a superpower in the sense that 
if platforms like Zapier didn't exist, um, you would be able to kind of drop down and just implement that kind of strategy through code. Um, and I think that depending on who you are and where your skill level is, one might be easier than another and one might be more powerful than another. So let's just think about what Zap is doing programming-wise. Um, and uh, what we want to build is kind of a, a little script, and I, I always like to take notes when I'm programming um, of like what I'm trying to do. So my goal is to build a script, to build a script that searches Twitter hashtag, and then we need to find all the users that tweeted with that hashtag, and then we need to grab one user at random declare them the winner by sending them a tweet. Right, so that's kind of our, our goal, and I always like to call this a tweetful, which would be like a Twitter-based raffle. Um, so that's kind of what we want to build, and uh, each of these actually represents kind of like a step uh, that a zap would do. And you know, Jordan was talking about this idea of like a trigger or an action, um, and kind of, you know, this is like almost our trigger it's going to be a search saying that uh, you know, when we find all the tweets that have that hashtag, we then need to kind of do some data processing uh, to get unique usernames. And then we're going to basically, this part over here is basically the action. Um, and that's kind of how what we're, the script we're about to build kind of corresponds or mirrors to the, gener to the general Zapier workflow also. Um, so the first part is going to be connecting to the Twitter search engine. And again, uh, you know, if we were using Zapier, this would be awesome, but we're going to use a programming language that I tend to love called uh, Ruby, um, which is a really fun language. And you know, Ruby and Python and JavaScript are all tremendously beginner friendly and really fun, um, but I just happen to like Ruby. We're actually going to use something called a gem. Uh, a gem is actually kind of like a zap, but for Ruby. Gems are little programs that are pre-built um, that allow you to do things like uh, connect to the Twitter API and search Twitter and things like that. Um, so if you're following along at home and you have a Ruby environment set up um, and, or you're familiar with Ruby at all, just do gem install Twitter and that's going to install the gem. And then I'm going to show you how we're going to be able to use that piece of software that we just installed to basically query for Twitter. So that's going to be step one. And uh, so we're going to connect to the Twitter search engine. And then we're going to search their API for a hashtag, right? Um, so in Zapier, this would be their searches functionality, um, which is really cool. And then, uh, so we're going to search for their, uh, their API for a hashtag, and we're going to get back all these tweets. And then we're going to basically create a randomization process or something that's going to take uh, all the unique usernames from the tweets and pick one at random. And then we're going to tweet back at them, and that's going to be step four, which is kind of the action. Um, and that's kind of, again, conceptually what we're trying to do. So let's get started. And I'm going to, you know, kind of just like Jordan, um, I'm not going to explain everything about the code because I don't want to get too mirrored into the details. But first of all, this is my text editor. I have been using Sublime right now. And uh, I'm actually just going to save this file as a file called tweefull.rb on my desktop. And that's going to be my script. So this is going to be my program. So the first step is basically connecting to Twitter. So connect that. This, this is going to be a Ruby program. So I'm just going to say, hi, welcome to your Tweetful. And let's just run this program. So puts basically just prints out text. So now I'm going to go to my terminal over here. And uh, I'm going to go to, i got to move this file because I put it in the wrong place. Hmm. Where is this directory? Uh, let me just move the file that's on my desktop to this deck directory right now. Okay, so if I run Ruby and I say Tweefl, that ran my little program and it says, hi, welcome to your Tweefl, okay? Which I spelt wrong, but I'll spell correctly in a second. Um, Tweefl, okay. And now we want to connect to Twitter. In order to connect to Twitter, we need to require that gem that we just loaded. So by saying require Twitter, I now have Twitter superpowers, okay? And let's just copy, you know, because the internet's a wonderful place, especially the open source community. If I look through, through this section, so it tells you how to install it, which you already did, um, 
Uh, I'm going to answer some questions. Uh, I see that they're coming in at the end of this, uh, by the way. So let me just continue, and we'll go that. You can see over here it says basically how you connect to the gem. So I'm just going to copy this code, and we're going to talk about it for a second and what it's doing. Um, so in programming, there's this idea of an object, and that's kind of an abstract concept. But let's just pretend that this word client over here represents a connection to Twitter. So that we're basically saying, using this gem Twitter, that we want to make a connection to Twitter. And we need some, some uh, like secrets and passwords and stuff like that in order for Twitter to authorize this and connect to Twitter on my behalf. And by the way, you've used this as a, a kind of a, 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 whenever you log into a website via Twitter, just know that there is some code on that web application that you're logging into that resembles this. So I already set up a little Twitter app over here. Um, called my Zapier demo application settings. I have a consumer key. Um, I'm going to paste that in over there. I have a consumer secret, which basically are these two strings that identify that the program we're writing is this Twitter uh, program. And then I'm going to take my access token. And this is going to be the fun part. I'm not going to tell you the fun part. But I'll tell you afterwards. Um, OK. So now, basically, let's uh, do something else. I'm going to get another gem. This one isn't as important. It's kind of low level. I just want to play with this, and I want to show you guys what we've already done from a programming level. So again, all I've done in my program right now is I've welcomed you, I loaded some superpowers, and then I connected to Twitter. And I know that this variable client represents a connection to Twitter. So let's run my program and see what happens. And it says nothing. Awesome. I must have either forgotten to save it. OK, I know what happened. Uh, I'm editing the wrong file. Uh, you see how it says that I'm on my desktop, tweefle.rb? That's that file, uh, and I just tried running a different file. So just always edit. Um, and let me just actually reopen this so I don't do that mistake again. Cool. There is my code. Let's do it one more time. Awesome. There we go. So I am now in a console, which is basically like a, a little programming sandbox where I can play with my program as it's running. So like if I look at this, this object, uh, this variable called clients, you can see that I have what's called an instance of a connection to Twitter. right? And if this variable client represents a connection to Twitter, I expect it to be able to do the kinds of things I can do on Twitter. Like for instance, I expect it to be able to search Twitter for a hashtag, like Flatiron Zapier. And now you see what I, this, this over here, this caret represents what we call a return value. So that means that when I ask Twitter to search for Flatiron Zapier, what I got back is another kind of object called a search result. And it's basically telling me, here are all the results from Twitter. And you can see there's probably a bunch of them that match that search. And this is what, it, this is what we call, I just programmatically, or through code, connected to the Twitter API and ran a search query on their services. And I get back all these Ruby objects and these, this data from their service that represents the results for that tweet, right? Which basically, again, is kind of equivalent. You know, if you go to Twitter, search.twitter.com, that's basically what we just implemented with like five lines of Ruby code. Um, and again, I know that programming seems really intimidating at first, but it's actually, you know, not that hard and pretty fun to learn. So, sorry, my computer is starting to. Go a little slow, flat iron, Zapier. So this is what we just did when I said client uh, dot search flat iron Zapier is equivalent to doing all of this, which is pretty awesome. Okay, um, so now that's kind of step one, is recognizing that we just connected to Twitter and uh, already knocked off kind of the first step of our list. So now I, I know that I can say it was client dot search, um, and now there's my hashtag flat iron Zapier. Okay. So now the next thing I need to do is I need to go through all of these results and collect the username of the person who sent the tweet. All right? Okay. Um, so I'm going to play with that object a little more. I just want to turn on my word wrap. Okay. So if I go back to my console over here, if I say, uh, so there's my search results, and I'm going to say results equals client.search flatiron zapier, like that. Um, and now I have a new variable called results. And in there, 
there is a method called each that I think will give me every result back. And there's a method called collect. So I don't know. Let me see what happens. But I say, if I, if I say, so if I say results and I say first, it looks like I get back a tweet. Um, and that's one of the first results. So if I say first, and then if I say, let's say, user, um, let's see if I say user, what I get back. So that gives me the user, and that's an ID. Let's say, what if I say user, is there a username? Hmm. So that's the tweet. What about results.first? So I'm just actually just playing with this object. I'm not 100% sure how to get back the usernames I'm looking for, but we'll figure it out. So first, uh, local methods. Let's see what we have on this. So uh, I'm basically asking this object, what can you tell me? So full text, that's probably the text of the tweet. Uh, in reply to screen name, media, metadata, place, quote, reply, retweet, symbols, 2H. I really feel like it should be in the user. Let's try. I, uh, and that gives me that. And what about this object? What does this have on it? Um, entities following ID. ID sounds interesting. Name sounds very interesting. So user.name, this should work. OK, cool. There we go. Um, what about uh, username? Does that work? OK, cool. Uh, use screen name instead. Cool. So now if I say, if I say results, which are all the search results, and I grab the first one, and then I grab the user of that first, uh, whoever sent that first tweet, which is the first search result, and then I ask them for the screen name, I will get back the screen name of the person who's, who's just uh, who just sent me that tweet. So this is kind of like my procedure for getting the screen name of the first user for the first search result, and that's Nicole, who's sitting right next to me. Um, but now, what I want to basically do is collect all of these. And I'm going to do this in like a really fun line of code. I'm going to say usernames equals results, and then I'm going to use the Ruby method called, called that gives me each tweet one at a time. And then I say for that tweet, what I want is the user and the screen name property. And I want to get back a new array or a new list of all of the screen names from the users for the tweets that are matched by the search results. Right? And that's called the collection process where I'm going through the results and I'm collecting for each result, for each tweet, I'm collecting the screen name of the user that sent that tweet. And that's what a collect process means. Right? So now my assumption is that after this line of code, what I should end up with is an array or a list of just these strings that are each person's username. And there you go. So now I have all of the people that have, I have all the people who've ever tweeted with this hashtag. And one of you is about to win a $25 game, game on gift, gift certificate. Um, now the thing is, you can see that Nicole has tweeted twice. So I don't want every, I don't want duplicates. I want unique usernames. Um, and this is the beautiful, this is like why I love Ruby, is because if I want, if I have an array, arrays start with brackets. So like here's colors. And I say, well there's one color red, there's another color red, there's another color yellow, right? So there's just a list of colors. And if I ask the colors for their size, right, I'll get back three. But now if I say colors.unique, and uh, we spell it like that, and now I only get back the unique elements in that array. So the size of that one is two. So with this simple operation of unique, I can actually just drop in dot .unique over there, and now I actually have the unique usernames. So I can test that again. Right, and now you can see that Nicole's in there only once, which is awesome. Right, that one line of code got us exactly the data we wanted. Um, and again, like I, I happen to know how to program, pre like so I know this stuff. But this is the idea of programming, and also this is my very much my process in that I write one line of code, I test it in my sandbox or, or my console, then I go back. And, you know, I think a lot of beginners think that programming is kind of like I don't know. Like, you think really hard, you come up with everything in your mind grapes, and then you just spit it all out, and then it just works. But I find programming to be more of like an editing process, where it's like kind of like a sculptor, where like I'll chisel off some rock, and then I step back and look at it. And I'm kind of going as I, I'm going kind of like through a flow of discovering what I'm trying to do and how I'm going to do that, as opposed to like conceiving of it all once and then dumping it all out. So that line of code worked. 
And now I just need to know, well, how do I get a random, how do I get a random element out of this array? Like if I have an array of numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, how do I get one random one out of that? And for that, uh, I'm actually going to do another thing that we like to do as programmers, which is I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to say how to get a random element out of an array, Ruby. Which is basically the like uh, key to a computer science degree is being really good at writing those queries. How to get a random element out of an array Ruby. And for Stack Overflow, that will tell me, here is the example, my array, stuff, whatever, blah, blah, blah. How do I get it? Just use array sample. So give it an array with two elements. Calling sample, you get foo or bar. Pretty awesome. Let's try that. There's my array of random numbers, and I'm going to say numbers equals one, two, three, four, five, whatever, right? And now if I say numbers.sample, I'm supposed to get back one random one. Oh, numbers.sample. Cool, so that seems to work. Sample just seems to just give us exactly what we wanted. Thank you, Goggle. So now I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to say winner equals usernames.sample. And now I have my winner. I'm going to say puts. The winner of today's Tweefle is, and I'm going to say winner. Uh, this over here basically injects the value of this variable on line 32 into the string, and it's called interpolation, which is a really fun interpolation. So now let's run the whole script and see what happens. Cool. So that would work, right, just like that. Um, but now, we're not done yet, though, because that was the search part, that was the trigger, now we need the action part, which is I need to know how to tweet at whoever is going to win. And by the way, Ryan, I'm super sorry that you can't actually win yet, because we're still developing, but once you get a tweet, whoever gets the tweet that we actually send out, then that'll be the winner, okay? So, okay, so now I want to go back into my little sandbox by saying binding.pry, and again, that's a pretty low-level programming thing, we don't need to worry about that, but I want to play with it, because I want to figure out how do I tweet now for my account. I remember we said this thing, clients, represents a connection to Twitter. So if I go to clients, right now this client is connected to my Twitter account. And if I go back to the documentation for the Twitter jam over here, it says usage examples. After configuring as the authenticated user, it says client.update. I am tweeting with at gem. Okay, cool. Let's just try that. If I say client.update, am I really already tweeting from Ruby? Just like that. Okay, and then I'll put in my hashtag, Flatiron Zapier. And now, if that works, um, let's go to my Twitter account and let's see what happened. And there it is, right? So we just now programmatically sent a tweet from Ruby through the Twitter API uh, to actually Twitter, and that was pretty awesome. So now I know that this line of code will allow me to tweet on my behalf. So now we can finish our little tweetful because I can put this back in and now say date. And say the winner of the at Flatiron School Zapier Twitter raffle is, I'm going to put an at symbol so they get notified. Um, I'm also just going to do one thing too, which is uh, I'm going to remove uh, my name from this and Nicole's name from this. Uh, okay, that's going to take a second. So let's get Nicole's name and uh, Gabby that. So that hopefully, uh, so that's basically just array algebra. So I'm saying take the results of the unique Twitter names, subtract them from these three Twitter names, and that should just give us non-flatiron people on this uh, little list. Okay. Uh, puts there are um, usernames dot size uh, people in the raffle. 
so that, and then says the winner is, and then says the winner of the Flatiron School Zapier Twitter raffle is, and then should tweet at that person from my account, and that should just work. All right, let's try it. Um, I guess if this works, whoever it works for has won. Okay, if it doesn't work, uh, we have to do it again. Cool, Ronnie, you won. Assuming that the tweet actually got sent out. Cool, there you go. So that is how you kind of build these kind of like automated bots that are basically what zaps are, but way lower level with, uh, again, depending on uh, who you are and what you know, either more work or less work. Um, the cool thing about once you're in Ruby or in JavaScript or in Python environments is that there's no ceiling to what you could do. So I can set up this to run every day or every this into a web app that allows you to build your own Tweefles by like, you know, you log in and you put in the hashtag and you put in one time the raffle runs and things like that. And that's why programming is awesome because you're really, um, there, there are no constraints to the kinds of things you can build with code. Um, you know, I always think that it's like kind of you, your imagination can run wild like a child's and you can build things that are infinitely complex, um, that integrate with millions of different data sources and kind of the internet is basically at your fingertips to bend to your will. Um, so that's pretty cool. So I think that's it. I mean, with, besides all the comments and stuff, it's like ended up being like, I don't know, like six lines of code, which just blows my mind that we live in a world that you can do this in. And now I need to do one other thing, because the truth is, if you guys were paying attention, these access tokens would basically give you unauthorized access to my Twitter account. So what the next thing I need to do is basically delete this app so that you guys cannot take over my Twitter account. Revoke token access. Awesome. And just to show you guys again, uh, I actually should get an authentication error. No, I did not. That's really annoying. That makes me now feel like I'm going to be insecure. Hmm. All right, anyway, I will break that later. Um, cool. So with that, uh, let's go, and I will answer questions. Um, so just to wrap up before I start answering the bunch of questions, we have like 10 minutes left. Um, learning a program is a little hard. It's definitely not impossible. It's just hard. Um, but you will learn to love it if you approach it with the right perspective. The best thing to do is just get started writing code. Um, Code Academy, Learn.co, there are a million great resources for it. Obviously, we love ours. Learn.co is awesome. You get to use a real environment. Um, and you know, to answer someone's question before, someone asked, what do you do if you don't have a Ruby environment set up? And the truth is, setting up a Ruby environment locally on Ubuntu or Windows or, or, or OSX is actually a little difficult. If you sign up for Learn.co, which is um, our educational platform that we built a Pattern, um, and you can read all about it over here. One of the things you get, and it's totally free to sign up, uh, one of the things you get is what we call the Learn IDE, which looks a little like this. In fact, I'm just going to start it back up. Um, so the Learn IDE is an integrated development environment. It's just like Sublime Text and it's just like Atom. The difference between the Learn IDE and Atom and Sublime Text is that the Learn IDE comes with an environment set up for you. So once it actually loads, I will show you what I mean. Okay, while that's loading, okay. So you see now over here, ah, come on. I have this little terminal, and it looks like this terminal is local, right? It looks like this, it kind of looks like this terminal over here, this environment is the same thing as this environment over here. It's not. This is actually a computer on the internet that is our student's computer. So that you're connected over here to a remote computer, and everything is already set up for you. So you can just start running random Ruby code and not have to worry, not to worry about setting up your own environment. You can run Node, um, and uh, you know I don't know if we have Python installed yet. Yep, you have Python um, and things like that. So that's kind of how our ID works, which is basically it gives you a text editor or terminal, so you're not programming in the browser, you're not using a contrived environment, you're using the same tools that professional developers use everywhere, things like command line, the shell, uh, you just don't have to all set it up all at once. Um, that makes it really easy to get started programming without having to worry about environment stuff. Um, so that's one other reason why to sign up for Learn.co, our online campus. Um, cool. So with that, uh, I'm going to answer questions. Let's see. Um, uh, what if we don't have Ruby installed? So uh, Abhijit, uh, uh, Abhi, I kind of just showed you what you can do with the Learn ID, and I think that's a great way to uh, you know, get around not installing Ruby. 
Um, is it easy to connect to Fitbit? I think that would be a question for Jordan. Is he still on the call? Hey, I am. Hey, Jordan. Sorry, it took a while to get back answer, in there. Is it uh, easy to connect to Fitbit with Zapier? So Fitbit does not have integration with Zapier right now. Um, okay, though well, there are some. Uh, there are some fitness apps that uh, that we do have connections to, um, and so let me see what those are. Let's see, Map My Fitness is one. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's it. Um, so uh, if you wanted to actually work uh, with Fitbit uh, and actually we, anybody can actually create a Fitbit. Fitbit integration, so you can actually sign up for our developer API, go in a service that we don't have connection to, and build an integration, uh, allowing you to create actions and searches and, and uh, triggers uh, for any API, um, which is kind of neat. It kind of opens up that platform. Though, depending on how Fitbit API works, you might be able to do that. Cool. Um, okay. So uh, first of all, thank you guys all for uh, trying to help me out with. Uh, I just saw I was going through the questions. People were like, "Resolve first name, username." You know, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, that's really nice. And then to answer a few other questions, uh, what was the link for the Twitter API? Okay, so I was using the Twitter gem, which wraps the Twitter API. And uh, again, we'd have to talk about that. The link for the Twitter API, if you just search for API Twitter, you'll get their documentation. I was using this gem over here that's on GitHub. Um, and I think we're recording this, so we'll be able to send you guys all an email with this with this uh, video if you want to follow along. Um, but gems make it really easy. I just think of them as super, superpowers. Like Twilio has a gem, Fitbit has a gem. Is it better to code in a virtual machine or on your main machine? What is the best environment for teaching websites to learn to code? Okay, uh, I think it is better to code on your main machine. I find virtual machines to add a layer of abstraction and processing that uh, I think slows me down. But it really depends. Uh, as a beginner, it is certainly better to code in whatever you can get working fast enough. Which is, as a beginner, you are not worried about doing it the best way possible. You're worried about making any progress. You'll always get better. But you know, I watch beginners slow down by like, should I use Docker or should I use a VM or should I use, should I learn JavaScript or should I learn Ruby? Just make a decision and move forward. Like, uh, I think that it's not about the first decision you make about learning whether what tool you're using, what language. It's about the thousand decisions you make after that. Um, and then in terms of uh, the best website to learn to code, uh, I just have to again say that I think our website is the best website to learn to code. <laughs> um, so if you just go to learn.co, um, I think that is the best uh, place to start thinking about learning to code. Um, it really just tries to, you know, similar to how you just saw, we love making it fun, we love making it uh, not intimidating, we love giving you guys real tools uh, and making it as simple as possible, but at the same time, I don't want to teach you how to ride a tricycle, because tricycles can't go uphill. I would teach you to ride a bike with training wheels. That way, when you get to a mountain, you could drop the training wheels and actually bike. Um, cool. I need to download a file, be FTP, unzip it. Is that possible? Uh, that is definitely possible via Ruby. Um, I will let Jordan speak to if that's possible via Zap. Uh, downloading the FTP or uh, a uh, file via FTP, I, I do not think is uh, a feature in Zapier. Um, Cool. I guess if you integrated um, with, uh, I guess you 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 could integrate with a uh, Brick FTP, which is an uh, is an FTP service. Um, though the easiest way to get a, a, a file into Zapier is usually through like Drop or uh, Dropbox or Box or another file sharing service like Google Drive. Cool. Um, another question is, can I do exactly what you did during this webinar on C9.io? Uh, yes, if your C9.io instance is set up to with a Ruby container, um, so if, if you can run Ruby code on it, like you can type in IRB, uh, then you will be able to do exactly what I just did. Uh, I access to Twitter and things like that. Um, the best place for free. Um, yeah, I mean, that we have a ton of content that is free on learn.co, so I will still say that I think learn.co is the best place to learn for free how to code online. Um, how do you learn while offline? What is a recommended Ruby primer? This is a great question, Lori. Um, I love uh, programming Ruby by Chris Pine. Um, this is one I think one of the most beginner-friendly books. It is free online. You can buy it. Uh, also, um, 
you can buy a paperback copy of it or a Kindle copy of it. I'm pretty sure that there's a PDF copy somewhere on the internet too. I think this is a great primer for beginner programmers. Um, I think it's really clear. Um, I think it's awesome. Um, learning, though, the truth is, though, you know, learning without the internet and without Google, that's, that's definitely a handicap. It's going to make it harder. Um, so I would try to, you know, find a place, whether it's a coffee shop, if you're in New York City, you know, you can come to our campus and say hello. Um, but find a place with the internet, find a place where you can focus. I think that's really motivational. Um, it's going to be easier if people are around. But I really love the Chris Pine Learn to Program book. I think it's a great Ruby primer. Um, is there a recording of this webinar available? Yes, we are recording it, and we're going to follow up via email and send it to you. Um, cool. So I think those are all the questions. And uh, yeah, with that, um, you know, you're going to get an email with us um, uh, with some follow-ups and some discounts on some of our courses um, and a recording. So thank you guys so much again for taking your time to uh, you know, watch us code. Um, and actually, a few more questions just came in. What are the best starter projects you can do with Notepad++? Uh, I don't know, Harsh. That's a good question. Um, let me get back to you on that one. I'll think about that. Um, so, yeah, I guess that is it. And then in terms of the winner, um, I will follow up with you uh, via DM and get your email address, and we will get you, the, uh, we'll get you uh, your discount, your, your gift card. Okay? Awesome. Thanks again, Nicole, Gab. Uh, it was really fun programming with you guys. I can't believe I got that working. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I was actually I, I was pretty nervous during all that, especially during the username fiasco. <laughs> all right, have a great day, guys. Thank you.